Worship is maybe one of the greatest gifts that we have as human beings. Um, I'm not sure what the animals, the birds uh, experience. I think they worship in, a, in their own way, but the capacity to be able to express what's going on inside of us, um, I think it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, to uh, find a better expression for that to happen than in singing and, and prayers and worship. And I'm so glad for the, the uh, ability we have that God has given us to do so. Well, it's good to be with you here again this morning. It's good to have a few of our home folks, uh, Dave and Kathy Shetler. Uh, their family showed up this morning. It's good to see them. And uh, Ashley's here. Uh, I'm not sure when you snuck in. It's good to see you. And uh, it's just good to uh, see all of you here this morning. So I'm going to invite you, if you would, uh, to turn to Romans chapter 14. I think if I were to to look over all of the subjects that I have spoken on in the, uh, in the last 25 years. I was ordained in 1996, so this is my 25th year as an ordained pastor. And I think if I were to, to look at the different subjects that I have spoken on, what I'd like to talk about this morning is probably the one I have spoken about the most in, in one shape or one form or another. And the reason for that, I think, is that it's what our lives are made up, but it's what my life has been made up um, in many ways, for the most part, as, as, as a pastor. So Romans chapter 14, I think we're probably familiar with this passage. We'll read maybe the first, um, oh, the thir- first 13 verses or so. And I'm sorry, Romans 14. I'm not sure what I said. Romans 14. And then uh, we'll just quickly turn and get a few verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and move right on in uh, and try to capture a few thoughts uh, from these passages this morning. So again, if you can, I invite you to stand together. We'll read this passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 14. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind." He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, if you could just turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you will quickly notice that this is uh, somewhat of a parallel passage in theme to Romans 14, Romans chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if a man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man this knowledge, 
For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. I think we'll stop reading there. Uh, you may be seated. The true story that uh, was brought to me um, in a first-person context, there's an older uh, Christian man, we'll call him Harold, and uh, found himself at a uh, father and son or a men and boys retreat, an annual retreat that the church there um, was sponsoring. He came there as a visitor from a distant country where he had spent most of his life as a missionary uh, there in that country. One of the highlights of the annual men and boys retreat there at this church he was visiting was the egg toss. And so the object of the game is very simple, if you've ever played it. Um, basically, you toss a raw egg back and forth between two people, and you keep moving away from each other. And whoever can, you know, have the greatest distance between you before the egg breaks, um, that is the one who wins the game. Now, Harold was visiting the retreat, and for the first time he was there, he was taken aback. Um, you see, he had spent over 50 years of his life living in this country and uh, a, a missionary to very poor people. And one of the ways that he had supported his family was by uh, having a flock of chickens and uh, selling these eggs. It provided food for him, and uh, he then sold these eggs to these poor native people in that country. And uh, he saw how that these people spent their meager earnings uh, to buy a few eggs to feed their families. And uh, so the organizers of the retreat, they were also godly men and men who had a heart for God. And they considered the egg toss to be a very inexpensive, fun thing they could do with their sons and with uh, the boys of the church. And uh, the way they looked at it is that there's times you could buy a dozen of eggs for less than a dollar a dozen. So take three dozen eggs for the egg toss, and you might have about $3 uh, invested in the thing, or $4 or 5 or whatever. Harold, on the other hand, he saw the whole thing as an extravagant and senseless waste. And so he went to the organizers of the event, and he told them so. What should the organizers of that event do. You know, uh, our lives are full of issues that we relate to, and uh, they are issues that we see differently from a conscience perspective. We relate to people who don't see things uh, in the same way that we do, and, and this morning it's not my intent to focus on any one particular subject. We could do that, but rather to talk about uh, a concept that I think will serve us well as we relate to these things that we look at uh, in our differences of conscience. So as we look at these passages here this morning, I think it, it, it's good for us to understand that whenever we read a, a, a passage of Scripture, we read it from a perspective, right? We bring our perspective, our particular point of view, and it's from this particular point of view that we interpret what that passage of Scripture means. Some of us have heard the uh, illustration or the, yeah, the illustration that is used to describe, uh, you know, where somebody comes out on something, and we use the illustration of the two ditches. We say that this person uh, went from this ditch, and they made so many changes, they end up right over here in this ditch. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that, that statement, it's two ditches. So the person saying that, talking about to do, uh, the two ditches, what perspective do you suppose that they assume, naturally? Anybody care to guess? What perspective have they assumed when they do that? They assume that they're right on the center line of the road, right? And they have the authority to say, 
where the ditch is on the right and where the authority is to, to say where the ditch is on the left. We instinctively assume the perspective of being in the center of the road. And, uh, and I wonder this morning if we were to take a survey, I, I guess I won't, but uh, as we read these passages of Scripture, probably fairly familiar, how many of us, as we read the passage from Romans chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I wonder how many of us assume the role of the stronger person and how many of us assume the role of the weaker? And I think that if we were honest with ourselves this morning, instinctively, almost always, we assume the role of the stronger person and the weaker person is usually the other guy. It's somebody else. I, and maybe you don't. Maybe you, maybe you assume the role of the weaker one and somebody else is a stronger. But I think we need to be honest with, with that assumption that we bring to some of these passages. So hopefully by the end of our session here this morning, we'll have a little bit of a better understanding of what defines strength and weakness so that we can assume the right perspective when we come to uh, these, these issues. So the primary issue being discussed was eating of meat, especially meat that had been offered to idols. And uh, the reason it was being discussed is because in the early church, this was the hot potato. Uh, no pun intended. This was just the thing that they were talking about it in evolved food uh, in their case. And today I realize that uh, things like actual idols or meat that, uh, or herbs and, or all things as it talks about here in Romans 14 are for the most part not the divisive issues among us. We don't argue about you know, whether you should eat herbs or, or whatever. But I wonder if over the years the church hasn't just added to the list of things, the potentially divisive issues that need to be worked through. And some of those issues are specifically addressed in scriptures, uh, but, but what we're re referencing this morning are the issues that are not specifically defined for us, spelled out in the Bible. And I think there's some important things in these passages that do in fact apply to the world that we live in. As we relate to, to all of these issues, such as who would have thought, masks, um, uh, who would have ever thought that wearing a mask would be a, a potentially divisive issue? We relate to uh, issues uh, relating to church policy. I'm talking to a church here, and if you don't have people in your group that don't have differences of opinion on church policy, you're a very unusual uh, group of people. Uh, I haven't met any yet that, that uh, everyone agrees on everything. I remember reading uh, some time ago about a church that split over the placement of the piano. They could not agree on the placement of the piano in the church, so they just divided. And, and this morning, if you think it's funny, it's just because it wasn't your church that was dealing with that, okay? Um, it's just happened to be what their deal was. Um, we, we, we relate to things like maybe the observance of the Sabbath. What is, what is right and what is too much uh, for Sundays? Um, we are living in a climate where even the subject or the discussion relating to politics can very quickly become divisive, not because it's wrong, but it's just divisive. Um, we relate to technology, the use of technology, something that all of us have to relate to, yet we don't agree necessarily on what is correct. Styles of worship and styles of music, it's what our lives are made up of. This is where we live this is the thing, these are the things that we have to relate to. And the question is, is there a way to navigate our way through uh, these issues that we feel differently about without them becoming divisive and, uh, and contentious? And I think the answer to these questions really uh, ends up depending on whether or not we are strong uh, or we are weak or whether uh, or how well uh, we understand the greatest commandment, maybe we could say. But I'm going to look just briefly here at Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the word uh, judging, um, we, we hear in our day a lot that, you know, we shouldn't judge, judge not, and so forth. But the word judging in this context means that we make a decision on whether a person's actions or their behaviors or the choices that they make 
whether or not those things are approved of or disapproved of by God. In other words, we, we, we tend to or we want to try to make those issues turning uh, what we call non-absolute issues and trying to make them absolute issues. And I think that's what it's talking about here in this context with the word judging. And there are times when we can do that. In fact, the Bible talks about the church needing to judge among ourselves. And that is uh, as we refer to the absolutes that God has given to us in his word. Uh, but today we're not talking about those times and situations, but rather just simply relating to each other as believers in our differences of conscience. So I want to look briefly uh, now at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, especially the words where it says knowledge and charity. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What does this passage, what does this verse mean here? And the more I have spent, uh, the more time I have spent looking at this passage, uh, the more that I have come to believe that I really don't understand this uh, as, as much as I should. In fact, something within me doesn't even really want to understand this passage of Scripture, and I'll try to explain. Knowledge in this context simply means a seeking to know or knowledge especially of spiritual truth, right? Uh, this is what it's talking about. It says that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What's wrong with knowledge? I, I love it. For me, as, a, as an objective, uh, not a very subjective person, uh, that makes perfect sense to me. You know, So for me, it's like, let's figure out what the right thing is and what the wrong thing is and just do it. You know, I'm the objective guy. That's, that's what makes sense to me. And this verse kind of messes with my objective mindset. And so I, I'm married to a wife who is much more subjective than me. And so as an objective person, sometimes I miss where she's coming from. In fact, it started early in her life. I remember we were on our, on our honeymoon early on, and uh, my wife loved the book Christie. And she read that book, and, and on our honeymoon, we had the opportunity to go into the area where the story was written. And they were doing an outdoor drama there, beautiful, beautiful place. And we were sitting there one evening uh, on the sides of a mountain, and they were playing out the story of Christy, doing a wonderful job. I'm this new husband, married about four days. And all at once, I, I hear something to my, to my right, and I look over, and my wife's just sobbing. I mean, she's just crying. And I look at her, and I said, oh, brother, what have I done? I didn't realize I'd done anything. And so I bump her, and I said, hey, it ain't real. And she's like, hey, just be quiet. Let me alone. Uh, I said, okay, all right. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on. And to her, it didn't matter. It wasn't real. It was real to her, and she was just loving it, right? So that's, I'm the objective. And so I look at this passage, knowledge before charity. And, it, and, and I, I'm wondering, what does this mean? This charity love thing just seems to complicate and muddy the water. And yet something tells me that to miss the meaning of these six words is to miss one of the foundational truths of the New Testament and of the, of the new covenant of a proper belief system. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Some time ago, I was having a conversation with one of my adult children. And at some point, she said, Dad, I don't think where you're at about a certain situation that involved uh, me, it involved her. She said, I don't think that you're at a, at a good place with that situation. And I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, what, 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 do you, what, what do you mean? Uh, I don't think you understand. I don't think your observation is correct. That was my, my vibes and my words to her. And uh, I went on to explain. I said, I haven't, you know, I've done this and I've done this and I haven't done these things and I haven't done those things either. And that ought to prove to you that your observation about where I'm at is incorrect. And then she said something that I don't think I'll ever forget. She said, Dad, it's not what you're doing or what you're not doing. She said, it's what I feel. 
And so I just simply had to say, okay, well, you're going to have to help me, help me see, help me understand what I don't see. And since that conversation, I've had this increasing awareness that she may well have been on to something in my life. After 20, however uh, many years in pastoring, doing all of the right stuff, but communicating something in my person that was off, something in my person that was not love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a chapter that kind of eliminates all of the loopholes that we sometimes use to manage and to cope with or to condone some of the dysfunctional aspects of our lives. By dysfunctional, I'm not talking about doing things that are, that are bad, but something in the spirit of who we are that is missing, and we end up with, this, with, with what 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is actually talking about as we relate to the issues of life. I was on another, I was reminded of another uh, account years ago relating to a person that was, um, and I don't know, as, as, as pastors, it feels like there will always be that person in your life, or usually there's a person in, in your life that, it, that, that they seem to assume the role that they are in your world to keep you on the straight and narrow. You know, that's kind of their job, to keep their pastor in line. Well, I was, I was relating to a person, a situation like that years ago, and, uh, and after the meeting, there were several of us in the meeting, and we left, and this person uh, ended up starting saying that, that Laban said this, and Laban said that, and the other. And I, I heard this, and I said, what in the world? I never said anything like that. And, and uh, if the meeting would have been recorded, I think the recording would prove that I never said anything like that. But I began to just start listening a little bit to what was being said. And I started looking at my heart as honestly as I could. And I had to acknowledge that everything or almost everything this person had said about me was a reality that I had actually felt in my heart. And don't ask me how this person figured it out, but evidently, evidently this person did. And I think that's what it's talking about in this passage. So as a parent, you might be thinking, you know, I never yell at my kids, and, and uh, I try to be very consistent with discipline, and I have family devotions and make them eat their veggies or whatever. I do all of these things. And as a husband and a wife, we don't, we don't fight. You know, we do the dishes together, or, or uh, we, we have date night, you know, once a month. And, uh, and she might say, I cook and clean to keep a nice house for him. And he says, I work my tail off to keep the checkbook, you know, so that she can get what she needs. And the child uh, says, I listen to my parents. You know, I don't stay out past curfew and I dress like I should. And we get our whole list of things put together. And these things are all uh, a- an important part of what it looks like to love. In fact, these are things that that are an important part of it. And yet we can do all of the above without it. And that is, I think, the caution of our text here. Jesus in John chapter 14, 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I've heard this uh, my whole life, and I've read it. And yet there is this sense, this technical sense, that we perhaps can keep his commandments and not love, or put another way, a man or a woman cannot truly love their spouse without expressing it in what they do for each other, and yet they can do all kinds of good things for each other without love. I, I think that that is a possibility. And the things themselves, or we could say, keeping the commandments or knowledge are not the proof of the love and yet, without them, true love does not exist. Does that make sense, or is that too complicated? I don't think we can truly love without these things, but we can do these things without love. And I think that's the point that's being made here. Love, and it must be, must be the motivation behind the flowers that I bring to my wife, or behind the keeping of the commandments, behind the eating of meat or not eating of meat. It has to be the energy behind that or the favorite meal that you prepare, whatever, behind knowing or knowledge and not the action itself. In other words, I can return good for evil for all of the wrong reasons. 
or I can do it with a true heart of agape love. And that is, I believe, the proof of the pudding. And I believe that that is why Jesus, right after telling us, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In that same context, a few verses later, he says, and this is my commandment, that you love one another. This is my commandment. And sometimes I think we can quickly, so quickly, forget that. And so I wonder if at times the church hasn't looked to knowledge, right? Such as right or wrong interpretation or right or wrong application. As important as that is, we have looked to those things as the foundation or perhaps the source of her unity or of her authenticity or her longevity. We got we to gotta get this stuff figured out and put together correctly with charity being a good or necessary but secondary option. Now, notice I didn't, I'm not saying here, please understand me, I'm not saying that knowledge is optional and uh, because it isn't. All truth must find an application to be of any value. Truth that is understood up here and isn't applied doesn't do us a whole lot of work. Of worth. I can, I can tell my wife all day long that I love her, but there's something about my behavior that needs to be the evidence of that. And I think we, we understand this. Chapter 13, verse 2 says, Though I understand all mysteries, and says all knowledge, and have, uh, and have not charity, I am nothing. I think what this is saying is that we can come up with the most perfect formula on how to do church and how to do family and how to do all of these things. We can do all of that, but it can be knowledge. It can be a knowledge-driven thing rather than coming from an energy of love. And I think that, that this thing plays out in very, very practical ways. For us, I think it played out uh, some time ago. Some of you, um, some of our Hope folks at least, may have heard me share this before. But uh, thinking about knowledge or charity, or knowledge before charity, I was, uh, uh, one evening, for whatever reasons, I got home late, and uh, and um, it, was, it was already way past, uh, well, it was, it was late in the evening. And I grew up, we always have a bedtime snack, which is why I had to go on a major, major uh, diet some time ago. But we always had a, a bedtime snack. And so I get home late, I get me a bowl of Cheerios and uh, get ready for my bedtime snack. Now, uh, it was a season of life where our life was extremely, extremely busy and very noisy. It still is to an extent. But uh, my wife and I, we, have, we, we find hard time to get together and actually connect and unwind and whatever, but as we get ready for bed, it's a good time to do that. So she was already upstairs getting ready for bed. I was late coming home, grabbed my bowl of Cheerios, and I thought that for her sake, I would take the Cheerios upstairs to the bedroom and uh, have some quality conversation with her. So I get up there and uh, started having my quality conversation with her, and at some point... Um, she mentioned something about the crunching of, of the Cheerios. And so, you know what I did? I got offended. Uh, literally, I got offended. I got my bowl of Cheerios and went down the kitchen and finished my bowl of Cheerios in the kitchen and had me a good old legitimate pout down there. <laughs> down to the last drop, like they say. So now we have an issue between husband and wife, right? It's going to have to be resolved at some point. I mean, I do want to get to bed at some point. So uh, we, what, what are our, our options here? So if we choose knowledge before charity, uh, which, by the way, is Old Covenant thinking, classic Old Testament thinking, uh, where, where justice is the highest goal, whatever is just and fair, that's the Old Covenant. So... Uh, what, what are we going, so if, if knowledge before charity is our way forward, then a resolution will need to be made based upon what is right or what is wrong in this situation, right? So what are our options? Number one, one option, the first thing we could do is go to the scripture and find a verse that either justifies or condemns eating Cheerios in your bedroom, right? One option. Second option, we could decide that oatmeal 
is okay, but not Cheerios in the bedroom. Or we could set a time and say no Cheerios in the bedroom after 9 o'clock. Or we could decide that the Cheerios are the problem, so we'll just stop buying Cheerios. Or we could gather a Cheerios Crunchers support group around us, and the Crunchers can go eat in that room, and the non-Crunchers are going to eat over here, right? Knowledge before charity is primarily a right versus wrong focus of which the highest goal is to bring justice and fairness. As I said, signature of the old covenant. And uh, knowledge, right from wrong, for me, I think we must be promoted in the right sequence in order for it to be in sync with the heartbeat, with the heart of the, new, of the New Testament or the New Covenant, if we're to capture the spirit of the kingdom, if we get these things turned around, we may find ourselves uh, frustrated trying to work our way through some non-absolute issue that, and, 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 that, and, and, and as we do that and not realize that the main issue uh, is not really the issue that we're dealing with. For the organizers of the men and boys camp out, for them in that situation, it meant canceling the event for that year, not because it was about eggs or because it was about knowledge, but it was actually about charity. It was about love. And that year, they just canceled it for the sake of the love of the brother that was there with them that, that time. Second Peter chapter 1, 5 through 6, it says, it's, and I don't think it's by coincidence that the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, add to knowledge temperance. And then he continues, then patience, and then godliness, then brotherly kindness, then charity. And you know, it's so easy to get stuck on knowledge and forget that knowledge without temperance, knowledge without patience and charity is really not true knowledge. And so Matthew Henry says, knowledge, or at least a high conceit of it, is very apt to swell the mind, to fill it with wind, and so puff it up. And sometimes we have, we have put all of our eggs in that knowledge basket because we know that we're right. And so the struggle to understand how to live this out, this concept, uh, is one that has existed since the early days of the church. We are not the first generation to relate to each other in our differences of, of, of uh, conscience. And so it goes back to the early days of the church. How do I relate to the other dedicated followers and disciples of Christ when they do not agree with my strongly held views on certain issues and vice versa? For example, uh, all of us agree, I believe, if I were to take a raise of hands, all of us would agree that the Holy Spirit is a, is, is a biblical concept. And so if I ask you the, the question, is it biblical to believe that the Holy Spirit is a current living reality in the life of the believers? I think every one of us would say absolutely amen. But you look at the subject of the Holy Spirit and you look at it throughout the course of history and, uh, and it has divided dedicated Christians for centuries. What does it actually mean? Does it mean speaking in tongues? Does it mean to speak prophetically? Is it a still, small voice? What, is it, what does it actually mean? Eschatology is another one. Is it biblical to believe in the literal return, the imminent literal return of Jesus Christ? Of course, we all agree. But how that's going to take place has divided us for centuries and continues to divide us even today on something that we agree is very biblical. Baptism is another one. Every one of us here this morning believes that baptism is scriptural. Upon confession of faith, we are to be baptized. But how to do it has divided us for centuries. And is it, you know, is it pouring? Is it sprinkling? Is it immersion? Is it one time, uh, three times forward, one time backwards? And we... We, we, we don't know. We, and so, and we all, we all believe what we believe. All three doctrines, absolutely biblical. All three divisive. Does this then mean that Christ is divided? It's a question that we have given to us from Scripture. And we again 
agree that no, Christ is not divided. So what does it actually mean? What, what is the purpose of this? And we tend to believe that the answer is simple. It's because people don't agree with me, right? Uh, that's, I'm not being serious about that. But as I look at that, this phenomenon, I believe, has happened for far too long and far too many dedicated Christians to be of random design. There's something going on here that uh, as, we, as we relate to this truth, and I don't claim to fully understand what the purpose of this is when genuine, dedicated followers of Christ don't agree on some of the specifics in Scripture. But I've come to, to wonder and believe that perhaps it has more to do with what God wants to do in us in the process than it is for us to get it exactly figured out and spelled out. Maybe there's something bigger going on that God wants us to get in touch with, even as my daughter pointed out in my own life, rather than that we get it uh, all figured out exactly. And perhaps that purpose has more to do with the two greatest commands than it does a perfect, flawless interpretation. Now, am I suggesting here that neutrality is the key to relating well when we're dealing with issues such as, uh, you know, the gifts of healing and baptism or whatever? Absolutely not. Neutrality does not create opportunity for agape love. Absolutely not. But neutrality creates a prime opportunity for indifference. And indifference is actually the polar opposite thing of love. It is actually uh, the opposite of love. Indifference pretends like non-absolutes don't matter, when in fact, that's what much of our lives are made up of. Do Cheerios matter? Do Cheerios in the bedroom matter? Well, sometimes if you're married, they do. Uh, they really do. Uh, and, and so we have to look at it, right? These things actually matter. We can just pretend like, oh, you know, this, I'm, you know. And uh, so indifference is an effort to turn our issues into non-issues so that we don't have to deal with the real issues. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's kind of what we do. We just say, oh, it's not an issue, and, and, but yet it is. We have to live with it. We have to relate to it. And so it's when every man is fully persuaded in his own mind on these non-absolute issues that we have one of the most basic ingredients, whether we like it or not, for exercising true agape love. And, uh, and I think that we have missed that sometimes and to see it, uh, miss the opportunity that is there. Have you ever wondered why God in his word didn't just spell out a few things a little bit more? As a, as a pastor, I think I can honestly say that, that if there would have been just a couple more words put in a few of these verses, it would have saved us a whole lot of grief and a whole lot of time at brothers' meetings or whatever. If it had just spelled it out a little bit more, and I don't think that it was by accident or an oversight that God didn't spell everything out for us. Not only was it not an oversight, but I think it has something to do with the very heart of what God is wanting to accomplish in us. And I believe that a, 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 an illustration of that is happening right in front of us in our nation. There's all these things that are taking place and we have strongly held opinions about what should happen and what shouldn't happen. But I wonder if God isn't up to something that is bigger than any particular issue. Maybe God is wanting to do something in us, in the process. And I believe it's the same thing that he wants to do, beginning with us as individuals and then us as a church, and then it could happen as a nation. Think about it. The very first institution that God created was marriage. In fact, it's the analogy that God uses uh, here to introduce or to illustrate his relationship with us as a groom-to-be relating to his future bride to be culminated in this heavenly union. And so tell me this morning, what is, what is more different? In many ways, what is more different than man and woman? and uh, more diverse, more opposite. And uh, in fact, there's a book that's written, I think it's by John Gray. Uh, I think the title of it is something like Men, is, Men Are From Mars and, and Women Are From Venus, or I may have those turned around. I suppose the, the distance is just as far. 
But he talks about worldviews, our worldviews, our emotional makeup, the way that we look at life, the way we watch the Christie play, whatever it is, is very, very different. We, we come to those things very different at a very core level. And you know, if knowledge supersedes charity, then this is truly a recipe for disaster, and it's God's idea. God set the whole thing up. And if knowledge comes before charity, it's, it's a disaster. And I believe we have seen it play out as disasters because we don't see it uh, for what it truly is. Why did God intentionally design that to be a part of his body, weak would need to relate to strong and, and, and vice versa? And I think that in order to answer this question, we must examine the question, and this is going to lead us, I think, to a, an understanding that will guide us through these things. The question is this, what is the purpose of strength? If God actually designed us as strong and as, a, as weak, what is the purpose of strength? And so again, I just go quickly, briefly back to the drawing board. We go back there to Genesis chapter 2, and it tells us there that it wasn't good that man should be alone. God took of a, uh, Adam's ribs. He made a woman and he gave her to a man. Now, the Bible says a lot of things about men and women. But if we were to kind of capture in a general way, the Bible talks in Proverbs about a man. And it says the glory of young men is their strength, Proverbs 20, 29. And then in Peter, it calls the woman there the weaker vessel. Uh, not in a demeaning way, but it refers to as a weaker vessel. So we have in the Bible played out for us this, this concept that men are known for their strength and women are, are, are to be seen as a weaker vessel. Again, not in a demeaning way. Physically, the average man possesses 50% more brute strength than women. And uh, 40% of a man's uh, weight is muscle and 23% uh, percent, uh, of a woman's weight is, is muscle. So you see the difference there. Now, there's a lot of give and take there, I suppose, sometimes. But, but that is the way we have been created, by the Creator from the very beginning, at our core difference. And here we can see that our very existence, the fact that we're here this morning and just simply exist in the earth, is a result of one who is known for his strength, the man, relating well and beautifully to the one who is weaker, or the woman. And, you know, today the world that we live in in its same-sex agenda, is trying its best to undo this divine design because, naturally speaking, it doesn't make sense. How can, how can you have a, a healthy environment where one is stronger, uh, there's a strong one and the weaker? Somehow we need to level this thing out. And, uh, and, and so it goes against the divine design of God. But today I'm convinced that God's idea of weak, relating to strong is part of a divine master plan to create an environment where his very nature and his character can be developed and where we as his creation can exist in an environment that is superior for both the weak and the strong, an environment that is superior for both of them to any environment that we could create with our own ideas of sameness. Let's get everybody just on the same page, and, and then we can live happily ever after. No, that's not how God has created us. Uh, that's not how he created us. He created us to live in the context of weak, uh, con uh, context of weak relating to strong. But when strength or being strong is un understood as a position of entitlement, which unfortunately it has so often because we have bought into the knowledge before charity thing, when it's seen as a position of entitlement, a person will view their role as the strong one, as a legitimate opportunity to serve themselves. I'm wearing the pants, thank you very much. And, uh, or, or like political capital, since I'm the strongest, it's got to go my way. That's not what it's talking about, and we'll see that in a moment here. I am strong, therefore I will give myself privileges because I'm mature enough to handle it. If you can't handle it, then don't do it. Again, 
going completely wrong places, not answering the question, what is the purpose of strength? If we want to capture the spirit of what is being communicated here in Romans chapter 14 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there needs to be a foundational truth established in our hearts, and it is this. Strength from a Christ-like perspective is determined not by how much I can get, how much I can get for myself, but by how much I can give. Let me repeat that. Strength from a Christ-like perspective is determined not by how much I can get, but by how much I can give. This defines the true purpose of strength. And this, I believe, will lay the foundation for us to be able to navigate our way through these things. On Thursday, January the 15th, actually it's, it's exactly, uh, I guess it's exactly uh, 11 years ago, yesterday or day before, U.S. Air Flight 1549 left New, New York LaGuardia Airport for Charlotte, North Carolina. It was a routine short flight, no big deal. And as usual, I'm sure the flight attendant went through the safety procedures on what to do in the unlikely event of a drop in air pressure or water landing. And as usual, I suppose almost nobody paid any attention. But the unlikely did happen. Shortly after takeoff, the jet flew into a flock of birds. Both engines failed, and the pilot had to make the decision to try to crash land the dead airplane into the Hudson River. And somehow, Chesley Sullenberger, the uh, captain, um, the uh, captain or the, the pilot, managed an incredible water landing, and miraculously, no one perished. And as that crippled jet lay sinking there in the Hudson, slowly sinking, the passengers quickly exited the plane and clung on to the, to the wings till help arrived. But uh, this is the point that I would like to emphasize here in the story. Captain Sullenberger, the strongest one on board that aircraft, the one who, as a result of years and years of experience as a pilot, was able to navigate that dead aircraft to an amazing water landing, went through the empty cockpit twice checking for passengers before emerging from that aircraft himself. In other words, if anybody was going to die as a result of not exiting the plane, before it sank, it was going to be Captain Sullenberger, the strongest man on board. He was going to be the one that died. We also have another illustration about another captain, and he's called the captain of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, that through death he might destroy him that hath power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus Christ here, proving his strength, not by how much he could take, but how much he could give. Proving his strength by how much he gave, not by how much he could get. You know, the, uh, the chief priests and the elders and the thief on the cross and the one thief and the watching crowd, they all basically said the same thing to Christ. They said, prove your strength by coming down from the cross. That's what they all said. Prove that you are strong by coming down. Jesus proved his strength by staying there on the cross and giving his life for us. And because of that, you and I are here today. Because of that. <clears throat> and I find that to be a living illustration. Christ, the strongest, the head of the church, has laid his life down for us because he wanted his life to trickle down to each and every one of us. That, I believe, is a model and the purpose of strength. And as we begin to absorb that reality, we come to passages like Romans 14. We come to passages that, that, that are like 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And we come to, the, to the, the bowls of Cheerios. And we come to whatever the issues of life. And it begins to give us a foundation of how to relate to those things. 
I want to look just for a moment here as I wrap this up here at the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's the passage that continues relating to the subject of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I won't take the time to read this. Um, and it's in the context of weak relating to strong and so forth. But in my own words, what Paul here was telling the, the, the church, he said, I want you to know that I know who I am in Christ and what my rights are as an apostle. He said, I know that your very existence spiritually is because of my work in your life. I'm aware of that. I know that I have the right to have a wife, as other men do. I know that I'm mature enough to eat and to drink pretty much whatever comes my way without spiritual harm. I know that when God speaks of not muzzling the ox, he's not talking about oxen. I know that I have a right to be rewarded for all of the sacrifices and labor I have bestowed upon you. And then we come to verse 12, the last part of verse 12. It says, Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. I believe the Apostle Paul here, living out what we could call the signature of Christ, having power that he does not use to benefit himself, but using that power to benefit someone else. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 19 through 23. It says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partakers thereof with you. I find this to be so significantly. Paul said, All of these rightful privileges that I have, I have chosen not to take those privileges. Because the gospel has been designed and created by God, by Jesus Christ, that we might be partakers of that gospel together. And he says, whatever it takes for you and I to be a partaker of the gospel of Jesus Christ together, I'm willing to do my part to make that thing possible. That, I believe, is so foundational to understanding this passage. Partakers with you. And you know, sometimes we have taken our rightful privileges, our meats, into our separate rooms and feasted on them, only to find ourselves coming up empty because God has, in fact, created us to eat Cheerios together. Excuse, I hope I'm not being too carnal here. He's created us to be able to do that together or eat oatmeal together, whatever, whatever, wherever you come out on that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, and by the way, a bowl of Cheerios uh, in the kitchen by herself and, and, and a bowl of oatmeal in the bedroom with herself wouldn't be very much fun anyway, would it? And I, I think that we, we forget that. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. I know what you may be thinking. Boy, this is going to be tough to dance to everybody's tune. Whatever everybody wants, that's what I have to try to do. But the question is this. When Paul became a Jew to the Jew... When he put himself under the law for those that were under the law, when he became weak for the weak, and uh, when he sought to become all things to all men, was Paul actually dancing to everybody's tune? Or was he simply seeking to be obedient to Christ? And I believe that God will give us the wisdom and the heart to be able to relate to the issues that we will inevitably face if you are in any kind of meaningful relationship. When the choices that we make in life are primarily motivated by pursuing my own rightful, uh, strongly held uh, freedoms and opinions and interests, or by pursuing knowledge above charity, I think we're missing a key ingredient of what it means to bear the image of Christ. There is this universal law, I believe, and we're all probably familiar with it, the universal law that says a person cannot primarily pursue their own well-being and be an active part of something greater than themselves. If you want to be part of something greater than yourself, you're not going to be able to do so if the primary agenda of your life or the primary motivation is your own well-being. And I think it's a principle that applies to old and young alike. Within the church, often there's this conflict between the, 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 the gray hair and the, and, the young, and the young people. 
Young people say, why are you so stuck in the mud? And the old people say, why do you want to constantly change? And there you have it. It's a call to both young and old. Because young and old have been called by God to be partakers of the gospel together. Let's find a way, young and old, to develop the heart of Christ as we relate to these very, very thorny and difficult issues sometimes. And I think this concept, you can't primarily pursue your own agenda and be part of something bigger than yourself. It applies to almost every area of life, whether, whether you're, you're in church or whether you're playing a good, a good game of volleyball. They tell me that uh, one of the main keys to winning in volleyball is to have, to have good setters. Uh, that is a key, one of the key ingredients in winning in volleyball. And I think it's also a vital key to meaningful relations within the church. We need good setters. We need uh, all of us, and I think that all of us need to learn what it's like to be good setters so that we can be, in the process, we can be partakers together of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, going back to the perspective of, of these passages, is our vantage point one of strength or weakness? I think Romans 15 1 to 3, which also follows immediately after 14, referring again to the subject. It says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And so I think the question, am I strong? Am I weak? I think can be answered, uh, can be determined by how well we are fulfilling these verses. May God bless you this morning as you seek to understand what this looks like in your church, what this looks like in your youth group, what this looks like in your marriage, in your relationship to your sons and your daughters and to your parents and to your kids' ministry or whatever, wh wherever you find yourself. I believe it lays the foundation that applies in all of these things. May God bless you. Shall we bow in prayer?